program. The content is the sole responsibility of the producer and does not necessarily reflect the views or policies of Oshkosh Community Access Television, the City of Oshkosh, the Oshkosh Cable Television Advisory Commission, or Time Warner Cable. Welcome to the very premier edition of Eye on Oshkosh. I'm one of your hosts, Cheryl Hentz, along with my co-host, Melanie Bleckel, who most of you, I'm sure, will recognize as the former mayor of the city of Oshkosh and a nearly 12-year member yeah. on our city council. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with me, I am a native of Oshkosh. Um, lived here most of my adult life and have served uh, during most of my adult life in a number of different capacities on various boards and commissions in both public and private entities. One of the reasons Melanie and I wanted to do this show is we feel that the citizens of Oshkosh need um, something other than just mainstream media as far as an information source and we hope that we can bring that to you. We will be covering a variety of issues, uh, mostly political in nature, some of them, however, will focus on events, either major events or something that's unique to the city of Oshkosh and Winnebago County. And we'd like you to be a very involved part of the show before the show ends and, in fact, during the show, you will be able to uh, see our address up on the screen. We'll have uh, an email address where you can contact us, a U.S. mail address, um, there's a website. All of that will be on the screen for you. Our very first guest today is uh, Dr. Jim Simmons. He is um, professor of political science and the chair of the political science department at University of Wisconsin Oshkosh. Welcome. Thank you Glad for to being be here. here. And uh, one of the things we're going to be talking about uh, is um, Wisconsin primaries. Now, we just obviously finished with a primary uh, a few weeks ago here in the state. A primary left an awful lot of people frustrated, um, confused, angry, and the reason for that is because we were unable to vote for candidates in more than one party. And I, I think that it's important that people try to understand why we have a primary the way we have it and how we came to have such, I think, is a silly law. <laughs> So, can you perhaps How's just that give us for a an <laughs> intro? You're going to try to fix a silly law right away. Your very first. No show doubt, where you stand in this issue. <laughs> well, and maybe it's just because I don't understand it. But uh, how? What's the history behind this, Jim? Well, we're one of the founding states of the open primary, and one of the states which was anti-party, progressive in the sense that it wanted to loosen the control of political machines, the backroom deals, and uh, partisan officials who used to control nominations. You understand that with the history of political parties that there were times when legislative candidates were nominated by caucuses. That is, the That's legislators right. would get together and nominate others or by party convention where precinct committee women and committee men would meet in convention and then select the nominees of the political party. The primary was a way in which party members could bypass the officials and nominate directly the, the uh, people who would lead their party for public office. Do you not, are there still not caucus things being done? <laughs> Obviously we've heard a lot about caucuses in the last year. Yeah, we'll get to that. <laughs> Obviously, <laughs> yeah. because of the primary system, the caucuses have changed what they do. Um, if you were frustrated with our primary, you'd be much more frustrated in 38 states because where you have a closed primary, you have to register by party or declare when you go to the polls. Mm -hmm. Many states, 30 days or even further ahead, you register as a Republican or a Democrat or uh, as a third party member. And when you go to the polls, you can only vote in that, in that party. In my home state of Indiana, you can say that you're now a Democrat, but then you have to file a petition that says that you've, s you've switched parties in order to vote. Really? Wow. And, and there's no confusion at the polls because if you say, if you've registered as a Republican, they give you the Republican ballot. If you said you were a Democrat, 
you, know, you, you get that ballot. And if in California, where you can register as independent, you can't vote in the primary. Now that, I would think, would disenfranchise wow. voters. But the point of primaries is that they're party primaries. They're, they're intended to find ways where at those who adhere to the political parties can nominate the candidates for that political party. They're not intended. And the problem is that increasingly, maybe a third of the population are strong Republicans, strong Democrats, real partisans. Uh, about a third of us claim to be independents. We may favor one party or another, but right. largely we see ourselves. And then there are weak partisans, so people who vote for Democrats most of the time or Republicans most of the time. And it's, that's where the frustration comes in because we're going from an era where most people were you know, Catholics or Protestants, Republicans right. or Democrats, to an era in which many people split their ticket, you know, see themselves as independents, and those are the frustrated people. Do you see a time, I, I know for myself, um, even when I ran for elected office, and we were kind of joking about this before the camera was rolling about identity crisis in mm -hmm. politicians, do you ever see a time when, there, when you don't have to subscribe to a party or a platform and that there will actually be a day where individual Americans can actually vote for other individual Americans? Well, again, this goes back to the progressive era. Remember that local elections used to be partisan as well. Mm -hmm. And now in about 70% uh, of local elections, the, there's, there's no party label. It's nonpartisan. You actually have one state, Nebraska, where the legislature, there's a single house, not two. It's unicameral, right. and it's nonpartisan. Um, the problem is, and this goes back to progressive era, when so many, uh, almost all offices were elected. You would elect the uh, city attorney, you elect the assessor, they weren't appointed. The problem is that most voters, including many of the independents, have no idea. I mean, they may have an idea about who's running for governor and they know something about them, but when you get to secretary of state, when you get to treasurer, tre treasurer attorney yeah. general, you haven't any idea. And the most information you really get is the party label. Mm -hmm. You can tell that you know, on nine out of 10 issues, a Democratic candidate for office is gonna differ from a Republican candidate for office. And so if you're not informed when you go to the polls, that party label provides you with a lot of information you wouldn't have otherwise. But does it really? Because the parties have come more to the center. I mean, I, I, I look at this and I, I don't see, I mean, you hear a lot of the political garb on, you know, this one's a conservative and then this one is a liberal. But really, when it all boils down and the political spin is put on both of the elections on both sides, they've come pretty close to the middle that you can't distinguish Republican from Democrat in many instances. Oh, but you can. In fact, they've become more partisan over the last 20 years. And one of the problems that we have in Washington and Madison is gridlock, because when you have divided government, that is one party controlling one house, one party controlling the other, mm -hmm. and a governor of a different political party, even if that person is independent like... Uh, the governor of Minnesota, uh, almost nothing gets done. You can't pass a budget. You can't pass any major legislation because of the divisions between the political parties. Would, would eliminating those political party affiliations soothe any of that? Or do you think there'd be more of it, but you'd call it something else besides It would be gridlock? very different, yeah. You, I'm not sure that Nebraska operates all that much better than Wisconsin, to tell you the truth. I haven't heard a lot about Nebraska. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's kind of an oddball. Um, mm -hmm. One of the problems is that, it, you know, the, the parties really do want to have their candidates, and they want candidates who really support most of the party positions. And the primaries allow for candidates to be nominated under a party label who may not be Republicans or Democrats. I mean, in, in this county, there are a number of Democrats who have run as Republicans because they think it's advantageous to do so. Sure. Um, there's also the problem of the crossover vote. When you have a primary, there may be a candidate who is not in tune with his political party, like George Wallace back in the 60s and 70s was running as a Democrat, and later he ran under his own party label. And a lot of independents crossed over into the Democratic Party and embarrassed um, Lyndon Johnson, <laughs> embarrassed the, the Democrat because of all these independents who wanted to vote for that person. Um, there, there's also strategic voting. I mean, one of the problems that you have is that, uh, you know, partisans may see no contest in their own cam campaign. And they may think, well, good, I'll just cross over and I'll embarrass the uh, opposition party. Let's say you, there wasn't any contest in the Democratic Party. 
and you thought, well, who's the weakest candidate for governor? How can I embarrass Scott McCallum? Why not vote for Lord? Get, hmm. Give him a large vote and make it appear that there's not as much support for the, the sitting governor as, as there is within his own political party. So you said that I had strategic thinking when that there, was happening. There, there may be strategic <laughs> thinking going on. Let's say, let's say, let's say you, you've decided there's no local race for prosecutor as there was here, right. and you're in a Republican county. Um, and you think, well, how shall I vote strategically? Why not vote for the weakest Democrat, the one least likely to be elected in the fall? Why don't I vote for Falk? Or maybe I vote strategically the other way. Who's most like, who do I most like? Who's more of a Republican? Right? You, then you don't vote for the Madison liberal, then you vote for Doyle. Mm -hmm. So you've got people who don't intend to vote for that party in the fall, I mean in the, in the general election, and are voting strategically either to get a Democrat, the, most, the Democrat they like the most, or the Republican they like the most, or one that can't be elected. But when we have such a low voter turnout, do you really, I mean, you're the political science professor. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe I'm being too simplistic here. Mm -hmm. But when you have the low voter turnout, right. do, you, do you really believe that the general public who does go out and vote is thinking of, of strategic voting and, and those kinds of things? Or do you think they just really want to have choices? I, frankly, since the low voter turnout tends to pick out strong partisans. I mean, one of the problems with primaries is they are low tur voter turnout. Independents are less likely to vote. People who don't have strong uh, partisan affiliations are less likely to vote. You get more strategic voting. Um, I'm, I was at a social club, and I'm not going to tell you which one it was, but there you had a number of people all saying, well, they didn't really care about the prosecutor's race. What they cared about was the governor's right. race, and most of them were Republicans, and they were talking about strategic voting in just the way I indicated. Yeah. I have heard that, too, Yeah, yeah. specifically with the district attorney's race. And, and you so. can do a lot of damage when 15, you know, 10 to 20 percent of the people are turning out. Sure. Uh, that brings me to a, a couple of questions um, with respect, once again, to partisan positions, partisan elected office. Um, you know, I, I don't understand, for example, why things like share for district attorney are partisan offices anyway. I mean, these are people who, sh who are elected and should be serving all people, not just Democrats, Republicans, independents, what have you. Why are those particular positions partisan? Well, there, were, there are many argue that they shouldn't be. Uh, that these are professionals, there ought to be a single standard for all sheriffs, mm -hmm. for all assessors, and so on. The problem is there are party differences, even in the case of a sheriff's race. Really? Yeah. Sure. Well, you know, the, uh, take, take Kathleen Falk. Her, her feeling about corrections was that there are a lot of victimless crimes. We should lock up the violent criminals, and, you know, we should reduce our spending on prisons mm -hmm. and put more people in work release and so on. And so if you have a Democrat running for sheriff, you're going to get someone who is less likely to big, want to build the largest jail. Mm. Who, you know, certain kinds of crimes they're less likely to be militant about enforcing and others that they treat more importantly. I, I can't think of an office in which there aren't partisan differences. Register of Deeds kind of threw me, though. That, uh, that, that's that okay. That's that's that an exception. One I, I think yeah, that's that right. one. I clerk think of courts. Right. Yeah. Exactly. That, those are yeah. those are some. I and and we could have another whole show on whether these people should even be elected because, quite frankly, then we have no control whatsoever. I mean, I believe that they should be hired professionals, and then you know we can fire them if they stop doing what we tell <laughs> them to. Right. But again, we're not on that show. We'll right. move to that <laughs> side, some but other time. To, to go back to your question about caucuses. Yeah. One of the things that's happening is that the parties aren't behaving like parties. In other words, they are not recruiting candidates for all offices that oh, are contested. Yes. So in many cases, there really is no choice. And that's one of the problems of the frustration. I mean, if the Republicans always had a choice for all the offices, and these were seriously contested races, then that would be one issue. And if the Democrats had the same, you wouldn't have to worry about crossover. You wouldn't have to worry about strategic voting. But in fact, that's not the case. Um, and in fact, what happens is that the parties oftentimes try to avoid contests because they think that a divisive race, like Carol Owens was complaining, here yeah. she had a divisive race, and if she didn't have opponents, 
she would have money that she could give to other Republicans. That was mm. the most frustrating comment that I had ever read in the paper in my life. I thought it was the most asinine thing I'd ever heard. Yes. Why wouldn't you not want to discuss and debate the issues that confront it during a budget that was so highly contentious and the only thing that they were worried about is, is emptying their coffers? Well, the answer I think is that Carol won't have an opponent in the general election, so all the money she raises from whatever groups or individuals she can then give to other Republican candidates. Greg Underheim, on the other hand, can't do that. Right. I mean, and in fact, this money he could then when he needs votes on a particular issue, he could say, remember when you were running for re-election and I, you know, I took 10,000 of my dollars and gave them to you because you had, a, had an opponent? Sure. That makes him much more influential in the legislature. Well, her, her comment, you know, not, not to get off on that, but we already have, so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I did raise it. <laughs> <laughs> her, her comment <coughs> really frustrated and, and angered me also because, um, you know, simply by virtue of the fact that she was elected once, or any politician for that matter, does not mean that they should just be able to sit there forever and ever and ever and have that position. I mean, that's why we have elections every couple of years for assembly type positions. But as Jim, and Jim will tell you, yeah. uh, I mean, by virtue of incumbency and, and the treasure trove of dollars that they begin with to, to jump into the fray, is almost an insurmountable task. I mean, it, I, and I can speak from personal experience. <laughs> speak, since you raised the question, yeah. <laughs> you, you discover that um, the party caucuses still function. They don't function in nominating candidates, but they certainly target candidates. Uh, the party caucus decided that you were a rogue Republican, yes. and of course, the governor and the caucus assisted Greg in your defeat. Um, and in fact, the parties and various interest groups in the state, whether it's the Wisconsin Manufacturers and Commerce or the state teachers unions, target candidates. They decide mm -hmm. that some candidates are electable and therefore those candidates receive money. In other contests, they decide, well, we can't win this race. Right. I mean, it, the, the, the incumbent isn't vulnerable or there's a, not an open seat, so therefore those candidates won't get any money. And all of this has led to a lot of races in which there are no contests and a lot of frustrated voters who would like at least the opportunity to vote for someone and don't have it. Do you ever see a time when getting back to some of these more local races, Jim, where maybe they won't be a partisan type race like the Register of Deeds, the district attorney? I, I hate to tell you this, but the nonpartisanship in local races was, it was enacted back in 19... 11 or 1912, I've forgotten the specific year, but it was an anti-socialist move. The two parties could get together making races nonpartisan so they wouldn't compete with each other and allow the opportunity of electing a socialist to a mayor or the city council. Mm -hmm. And they felt, and you know, without the party label, they felt working class voters wouldn't know who the socialist candidates were. <laughs> so, wow. That's it's kind amazing. of interesting. Yeah, it's really <laughs> that it's amazing what you find out, how far back some of this stuff goes. I mean, just and and we were talking again before cameras were rolling, and I was kind of complaining about how Wisconsin primaries were closed. They're not closed, as you no. said in the beginning. They're quite frankly very open compared to everyone else. You stated that uh, 38 states had closed, closed right. which literally you had to determine what your party was, you register. register well ahead of time before the primary, or when you get to the primary, you have to declare. Now, what, what are some of the states that don't make you do that? Who would be, I mean, if we're one of the most liberal, who is One of the that? nine that have open primaries. Yeah. There's another primary that's called blanket primary. And um, in Washington and Alaska, you have the primary that you would like. That is, you go, you're given a ballot, and uh, you can vote, you can, you can cross over. Um, Louisiana has something even more liberal. Louisiana, there are no party labels, so it's nonpartisan. And um, the primary can produce the winner if there's a majority of the vote. So you, you are basically voting for people for an office in the primary. And if no one gets a majority, then there's a runoff between the two leading candidates. See, I like that better. <laughs> I really well, do. Well, I'm not, not encouraging you to move to Louisiana, but I don't no. see a strong movement in Wisconsin for that. And do you think that that's due to the incumbency and, and due to the, the setup that we presently have because so many people have been ingrained for so long and been beneficiaries of the system? The political parties write the rules. 
Um, when it comes to public funding, they write rules in which two parties are going to get funding. When it comes to uh, <laughs> placement on the ballot, that's also determined by political parties. Um, <laughs> you don't have independents in the legislature. You don't yeah. have third parties in the legislature. So there's no one who's an advocate of any change in the rules. So none of this could ever be folded into campaign finance reform legislation or anything like that. I mean, we piggyback crazier things than this kind of That's stuff into, sure. into budgetary. Well, from, from the standpoint of people who are strong partisans, this would be like asking uh, <laughs> to allow Lutherans to vote for the Pope. Or oh, there you yeah, go, yeah. Or, or Catholics to elect your local minister in your church. That bad, huh? Yeah, I don't think that's going to happen anymore. So anyway, we will so. not ever in our lifetime <laughs> see parties done away with. Yeah, Cheryl, I won't say that. Because <laughs> one, of the, one of the trends I mentioned is the frustration is increasing because about a third of Americans claim to be independent. And many of the people who are partisans are partisans some of the time, mm -hmm. but not all the time. So this oh. is where the pressure is coming from. Is it possible um, to get uh, doing away with a party to get that type of thing on a referendum vote on a statewide level, for example, to just do away with the party systems That's altogether? If, if you lived in California, you could do that. In fact, if you lived in Washington, one of the states that, that does in fact do that, you could do that. You put propositions on the ballot. These mm -hmm. are initiatives. The propositions, if they are voted by a majority, become law, whether or not the legislature wants them or not. In Wisconsin, however, there are referendums on the Constitution if you want to change it, but those are put on the ballot by the legislature, not by you. And if you want to raise taxes beyond the property valuation in a city or in a county, then that has to be done by referendum. But there is no way for you to initiate a proposition or referendum that changes the law. So we'd have to change the constitution of the state and then perhaps You'd have to change the legislature of the state. I was just going to say, then, first we start with the people, yeah. then the constitution. And you'd have to replace many of the people in the legislature who are strong party members who have no real reason to want to do that. Very much an uphill battle, it sounds like. It sounds as though pretty much we're going to be saddled with this system um, that, that has left people very frustrated and quite frankly from my perspective disenfranchised because mm -hmm. in, in, in the last primary which was the one that's so near and dear to everyone's heart you know with the district attorney's race and a very big governor's race I mean this has probably been the most excitement that people have seen in the state of Wisconsin in a good long time um, I chose to vote in a local race because I feel as though and probably you know, a little biased here, but I, I really believe that local government is as close to my front door and will affect my life every day, and I felt as though that was the important one. Um, so I had to forego supporting a governor on the other side that I would have liked to have support. So my strategic thinking in the Republican <laughs> primary didn't pay off so well. <laughs> well, from the standpoint of party officials, and put yourself in a position of the Republican county chairman, a divisive Republican prosecutor's race was the worst thing that could happen. Because ordinarily, the Republican Party would elect the sheriff, would elect all of those offices, and this mm -hmm. would strengthen the party. You have a divisive race for prosecutor, and what happens? Suddenly, the Democratic candidate, lo and behold, there actually is one, yes. suddenly he becomes a serious contender. Exactly. It's going to be interesting. I think the general election is going to be equally as interesting as the primary. It will be. Now, uh, in, in these other states mm -hmm. where they have more stringent primary laws than, than we do, you can, however, in the general election, cross party lines if you want to? Of course. Okay. I mean, the parties care about how the, who's nominated and the extent to which they adhere to, you know, the, the party line on most issues. And, they're, and, of course, they want people who also support the party and who can be elected. I mean, all of these things go into it. The parties don't want to nominate people who are very conservative or strong adherents of the party line mm -hmm. but aren't electable because right. of the personality or because they're extremist. Mm -hmm. So, but remember, there are other things that go on. Now, my home state of Indiana, local elections are partisan, too. So if you were running for city council or running for mayor, you'd be running as a Democrat or a Republican. Um, uh, in some places, even the city attorney or the city assessor really? or, you know, uh, the chief of police can be a partisan office. Wow. 
I, I mean, we elect, <laughs> I mean, remember, that we're, we're electing sheriffs, and it's right. a very sure. similar kind of right. position. Sure. And uh, it's a strong party state. They have nominating conventions. So not only do you register by party 30 days ahead of time, but the parties have slates. And, you know, they have conventions, and they come out with a slate. And they say, well, you know, they give you the slate. This is the candidate the party endorses. Well, having, having voted mm -hmm. in, in both types of systems, mm -hmm. do you have some preference as to which you prefer, or, well, that would be a preference, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> or, or which works better? Well, I have to admit that I tend to be partisan. I mean, and... Uh, I find that so hard to believe, because you're just <laughs> normally such an easygoing guy with but, no... But, I mean, I, I have to admit that I, I would like to see some changes that would allow more competition. That is, two parties are mm -hmm. too few. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that the rules are written to benefit the established parties. Uh, it also seems to me that there are other methods of selecting city councils that would be, you know, you know, I, I know that s some people like Steve Barney have become before you and talked about other systems, instant runoff primaries, board accounts, and so on, that would give you a better indicator of who, who ought to be on the council than, than what we currently do. But those are even less likely to be enacted than what hmm. you're talking about. Wow. Okay. Well, uh, we're just about out of time, but any closing thoughts, Jim, on, or any predictions on the general election? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not going to go we there. Didn't ask him but, didn't. I, uh, you know, I really encourage you. I'm happy to see your, your program. Um, I'd like to see more like it. Uh, one of the problems that you have with primaries is there's too little information. I mean, if you wanted to know about the candidates, could you do that by reading the local newspaper? Could you do that by watching television, or is one forum by the league enough to know enough right. to make an educated decision? I don't think so. Well, and, and the League of Women Voters, you know, God bless them for putting on the forums that they do, but it is only a one-shot thing, and they don't give the candidates really an opportunity to interact a whole lot. You know, there should be more of a true debate style for that format, I think. And, and the newspaper, a candidate taking positions on issues and issuing uh, position papers, that's not news. They don't cover it. That's right. That's right. It, that's absolutely right. And I can, uh, one of the things that the League of Women Voters did when um, I said, these are so boring. As a candidate, even in local races, um, we, I served for 11 and a half years. I mean, you knew what the questions were going to be. Nothing ever changed. It was taxes, the, you know, it was the same kind of questions. I said, you know, if you really want to spice this up a smidge, why don't we have candidates asking other candidates questions and see, give them a chance to fire back? We've spiced it up a little. we got a long way to go. But that's why we're here. Well, it, and I think the audience should have more of a role. I, I mean, I understand that the, that the league does give you the opportunity to funnel questions to them, but they kind of vet through those. And I, I understand, too, you've got to kind of moderate things a little bit. But I, I don't think that the questions are being asked of the candidates that the people who are voting really want to hear. I think so. we should let them pop up out of the audience and ask <laughs> them. You know, I think that would be exciting. All right. Well, thank you very much for being here today, Jim. That's great. We've got one minute left, and um, I guess in that particular minute, I would just like to thank you all at home for joining us as well. Um, this is kind of what the show, I on Oshkosh, is going to be all about. Uh, we hope that you'll tune in next week and join us once again. Our guest then will be uh, Mike Brooks. Mike is uh, running for another term as Winnebago County Sheriff. Um, he'll be joining us to talk about what he's accomplished during his last term and term prior to that, um, and what he envisions for the future of the Winnebago County Sheriff's Department uh, should he be elected again. In the meantime, please feel free to contact us once again, either by ground mail, uh, U.S. mail, uh, email. Check out our website address. It's www.ionoshkosh.com, and we'll see you next week. For Melanie Bleckel, I'm Cheryl Hentz. Keep your eye here on us because we've got our eye on Oshkosh. Take care. Bye. Thanks, Jill.